Hello, and welcome to a special edition of the Worn and Wound podcast, uh, which is brought to you by uh, our friends over at Grand Seiko. I'm joined uh, today by special guest Joe Kirk, brand curator of Grand Thank Seiko you, America. Yeah. Thank you for so much for coming on the podcast. No, it's my pleasure. Uh, it's always uh, always a good time. This is your third time on, I believe, yeah. which makes you a regular, I believe. I think or so. Close to I, it. Yeah. yeah, it's yeah. got to be close. Yeah. Right. Awesome, awesome. Well, and obviously, I'm Zach Weiss, co-founder. Uh, you guys might have heard of me before or have seen me on the podcast before. I don't know. Pretty sure they have. Yeah. Hopefully, yeah. hopefully. Um, well, it's tradition to start with a wrist check, so we're not going to break tradition. Of course. So what watch do you have on today, Joe? So I, uh, I'm, I'm very excited because this is very new for me, and I've got a lovely smudge on it, is the, uh, is the White Birch SLGH005 is the uh, high beat 9S A5 caliber that we've launched in 2020, but uh, this model was introduced in the beginning of 2021. If you know me, you know I've been after this for a long time. They're very hard to get, even if you work for Grand Seiko, <laughs> which is kind of silly, but uh, that's the way it is. High demand. You know? Yeah, yeah, very yeah. much so. It's it's one of our top selling SKUs and not a not a very wide production on it, so mm -hmm. limited availability, but uh, so worth it. You yeah. Know? And so this, I mean, like this is actually this is your watch. This is correct. Yeah, yours. this yeah. is this is mine. It is uh, production. Like it. Yeah. Yep. This is. Uh, that's fantastic. Not too much abuse on it yet, but don't worry, yeah. I will. <laughs> with um not to just start talking about well, the white birch but here it is we might as well so with this movement this uh the it's right so nine nine sa5 correct i'm bad at memorizing movements but that's all right i'm working on i'm working nine sa5 movement i mean given the uh new escapement the complexity of this yeah. is this does it like literally take longer to make is it a more complicated piece to put together well uh you know i mean at least to uh, some of the feedback that i've heard mm -hmm. from from the craftsman in the shizuku ishi studio where they make this piece it's entirely different than anything they've ever done before okay so you know one of the big challenges in just any mechanical Grand Seiko in the 9S series is adjusting the hairspring. Mm -hmm. And for vast majority of our watches, not including the 9S A5, um, they have a flat hairspring. Mm. So they are experts at, you know, a flat, you know, spiral, right, right. basically, and, and adjusting that to the very strict standard that Grand Seiko has for uh, its, you know, Grand Seiko standard, which is our accuracy test, mm -hmm. right? So this is an overcoil. Yeah. And they have to use a special jig, but uh, basically, you know, this is a, a, a shape. The overcoil is formed by hand mm -hmm. and is a totally new task for them. Okay, wow. So that's uh, a, a bit more work than yeah. I think they, they've ever experienced. And, um, you know, now it's got a free sprung balance, which, mm -hmm. you know, thankfully, um, one of the key features of the free sprung balance is that, like, it's easy to adjust mm -hmm. both in rate and the isochronism. Okay. Uh, which is a new patented feature on the 9SA5. So, uh, a yeah. couple Forget of things. just how much is yeah. new with that watch and that movement. It's like, everything. you know, everything. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's an in-house escapement design. It's like so it's yeah. free-sprung as an overcoil balance, which I totally forgot about until this moment as yeah. well. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, that's the other, that's yeah. the other thing is, like, it's a, it's a small eight-tooth uh, escape wheel where, mm. you know, most of, uh, you know, in watchmaking in general is like 15 to 20 teeth on an okay. escape wheel and you know it's just a an entirely new shape of the pallet fork and and escape wheel and you know it's uh it's really yeah. cool and and very innovative but you know the overall goal is to make it as energy efficient as possible mm. so that's why all of you know this escapement has changed very cool we'll probably get back to the white birch later of course, yeah, please. i have to uh have to do my part you know. yeah so sorry I my, please i might spga 375 <laughs> uh which was uh my first Grand Seiko. It's yeah, funny to say my first well. Grand Seiko because yeah. I, I didn't expect to have more than one in such a short amount of time, but I now have a collection of Grand <laughs> Seikos. You know, um, it builds quick. It, yeah. It, it yeah. becomes consuming. Yeah. Right? Well, last, I mean, your last year plus, I mean, but I feel like last year, but it, like the rate of the watches that were coming out, just like it's, there's been a lot of temptation let's say so yes. uh it's been hard <laughs> it's been hard to resist but i'm glad <laughs> i'm glad i started here because this is a model that um uh is a uh, widely available i mean it's for for grand seiko i mean it's not limited production it's been in the line for a little while it seems to be i didn't have to wait for it when i got it kind of a thing yeah. so i like yeah. that it's um i mean it's like a standard model it's like very like true to kind of like a core yeah spring that's ring drive 44 gs case that's model, exactly you know? it. like it's a car core part of our lineup yeah and it's a, it's a great watch. I, I expected to uh, 
treat it really well and make it a special occasion watch. Um, I then wore it every day for several months, pretty much, when I wasn't reviewing something else. <laughs> and um, I mean, it has the scars to prove it. There's even, I think, a little dent, which at first I was like, wow, how did I do that? But now I'm like, no, it's good. It's mm-hmm. just proof. It's evidence of the, the wear and tear. I, I mean, I, I love this watch. It's like, I don't want to take it off. Well, that, you know, I mean, if uh, down the road, you know, if you do manage to have a pretty deep dent in it, um, we <laughs> we just started in yeah. uh, last in last year uh, offering a laser welding. Oh, in, really? In Japan, yeah. So oh, that, that keep it in mind. You know, okay. if you you know okay. you can be abusive to it, don't, you know, <laughs> don't worry. You can uh, bring it back to, to good I health. I like it. It's one of those things. Say. It's the first scratch is the hardest, right? Of and course, then once yeah. once you're past that, it's like they're all mine. They're all just part of wearing it, and it's good that it's not precious anymore. Luckily, I also have two other <laughs> Segos, which I have here just for fun, just in case we end up talking about them. But, um, yeah, I've uh, uh, become pretty, uh, I don't know what to say. My affection for the brand has grown a lot over the last year. So I can see uh, that. Yeah, yeah, I know. And you've got, some, you've got some exemplary models, to say the least. <laughs> so. so since uh, you were last on, we talked about the Nature of Time Boutique, which was uh, relatively new. It was in 2020. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, it was a pop-up store in Soho that uh, we partnered with Watches of Switzerland on and was a huge success. Yeah. And I mean, and so much so that you uh, have now opened full-time boutique in New York City. Yes, yeah, so it's no longer a pop-up, and yeah. it's a full-fledged uh, boutique in partnership with Watches of Switzerland, which is the first of its kind, mm-hmm. uh, which is very neat, um, you know, and it's still in Soho on uh, Spring Street, so, you know, it's a, yeah. it's a great area, very lively, and even, uh, you know, during the pandemic was, was still a very, you know, mm-hmm. uh, hot area to go and, and check out, so. Yeah, I think when I first visited it, I was like, oh, Soho's all right. And so if everyone was still outside. Yeah. Um, is there anything like special in the boutique currently that is like hard to see elsewhere? Is it now pretty much the core lineup? So remember the nature of time had sort of some different stuff. Yeah. So in yeah. you know we try and do this with all of our boutiques. Uh, mm-hmm. You know we have the Soho uh, you know store in partnership with Watches of Switzerland, like I said, but we also have the uh, you know the the one on Madison Avenue, uh, mm-hmm. one in Beverly Hills, and then one in Miami Design District. So we try and sprinkle little, you know, hidden gems in each of those stores to, okay. to kind of, uh, you know, keep people guessing. Yeah. Um, you know, not always are they listed on our website or, you know, available, uh, you know, in this country. Yeah. So that's always right. something to, yeah, to yeah. keep in mind. That's very cool. But yeah, there's some cool gold pieces with 44 GS cases similar to what you're wearing yeah. uh, in Soho right now, if I remember correctly. That's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> I, um, the last time I was there, you gave us a, a tour of some Crador models and some Masterpiece models and I things that do that. not, yeah, that was that was special. Those, those uh, <laughs> Stardust dials, I'd never seen those uh, in person before. Yeah, that's like, that, that's a completely unique uh, manufacturing technique. And, yeah. you know, we have it on our eight days. We, you know, for the white dial, we call it Diamond Dust because it's more reminiscent of the, the sp- like the sparkling ice particles in the sky mm. is a natural phenomenon. Uh, and then the Stardust is the darker dial. Generally, we only have in continuing production the eight day in rose gold with mm. a black dial and this, uh, you know, gold tone sparkling effect. Right? Yeah, yeah. And then uh, we also introduced the SBGZ007, uh, which is the hand carved case with mm. the blue dial. Yeah, yeah. And, I remember and that one. And the Stardust, uh, that it's one's so good. Yeah. yeah. yeah it's, it's uh, the first time we were actually, it was very challenging to achieve the appropriate color blue in mm. manufacturing that dial. So that's why we've, you know, we're doing it for the first time with that watch. Very cool. Yeah. That was when it's kind of like lapis lazuli. Am I gonna perk it? Or I, it kind of, it kind of yeah. looks like that. Uh, a lot of people think it's avatarine or okay. you know some kind of uh, mineral or rock or whatever mm. you know it may be. But uh, it's actually a manufacturing technique just to ensure you know the high durability, longevity stuff like that. Right. So. Right. And another cool thing that you guys have, have launched since since your last year was the uh, GS Nine Club USA. Yeah. So can you uh, tell us about that a bit? So uh, GS9 Club is basically Grand Seiko Collectors Club. Uh, it started in Japan in 2015, so it was only available to you know collectors who lived in Japan. Um, and you know if you purchased a Grand Seiko watch from the time they started the club mm-hmm. to you know current date, um, you you were eligible to join. And the huge draw for that was always, you know, the big events that they'd host, right? They'd bring watchmakers in, they'd mm. do all these, you know, cool little, uh, you know, activities, and they were great gifts. Like, that's, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> my first time going to Japan, I went to uh, one of the early GS9 Club events, 
And I was like, this is amazing. You know, and I hoped yeah. that we'd always bring it to the U.S. Early 22, let's say uh, late 2019, early 2020, uh, you know, we were able to finally launch uh, the GS9 Club that year. So we started planning and unfortunately the pandemic hits yeah. and we turned it into a digital format. So, you know, we tried to create that experience digitally and uh, I think we, you know, we did an exceptional job in, in that regard. Um, but, you know, it's really about the event and the, you know, of course, the gift items people love, too. So um, of course. Who doesn't I think like I think you you uh, may have joined us for that event. It was, yeah, so we yeah. threw our inaugural event yeah. November, uh, November 6th. And you weren't you didn't just join us. You were on one of our panels panel. as well. Yeah. In all fairness, I'm acting. <laughs> I'm playing a lay person. No, no, yeah, yeah. you you yeah, no, it was well learned. It was, it was a beautiful event. And Thank it you. It was very enjoyable. Um, and I, I, you know, what, what I didn't expect going into it was I, the, the setup you guys had, particularly you know that kind of like museum room you set yeah. up, which was very cleverly. I, I guess that room is some sort of auditorium normally. Yeah, yeah, um, it's a uh, you know like a concert venue. Yeah. Yeah, Jazz and Lincoln Center. Yeah. It was an um, incredible view of uh, the park and the and buildings, but you had like on these different, just trying to paint the picture for her, there was essentially like these, <laughs> ste- these it's like these stepped auditorium, uh, uh, you know, concert hall, and you had uh, the different levels, different um, kind of right. activations. There was, there were different watches, there were different like mechanisms, gizmos. The thing that I still, I, I have a video of it on my phone somewhere. The like lo- giant sized uh, magic lever. Yeah. That was <laughs> cool. amazing. Acrylic, uh, you know, reenactment, let's, yeah. call, let's call it. Well, I didn't think I understood what it did until I saw it like that. Yeah. Like it's just so clever. It is. Um, it is. Try and make it like a, you know, a self-winding mechanism that's super simple, but, uh, you know, and containing as few parts as possible and still make it basically like in a relatively thin and flat watch. That yeah. the one you were playing with was actually the new uh, variation for our 9R A2 and A5 calibers. Oh, yeah. So. so that's the like offset version? That's, yeah, that was the yeah. offset yeah. version, which is pretty neat. So yeah. yeah, we had like a little museum on the on the bottom floor. The mm-hmm. next tier up, you were, you know, we were trying to give you a little bit of a, a taste of our Shizuku Ishi studio. And, uh, you know, we're, we're a very proud sponsor of Horological Society of New York. Mm-hmm. Uh, they helped us since we couldn't have a watchmaker come out from Japan. Uh, we we had Horological Society there to help yeah, teach cool. our, uh, you know, our members how to build a mechanical watch. So mm-hmm. that was a, a great experience. Got a lot of amazing feedback from that. Next floor up was the Shinshu Studio. And we actually had uh, uh, our, our watchmakers from our, uh, you know, office, uh, from our uh, service center here in the USA, uh, were demonstrating assembly of spring drive and quartz. Mm-hmm. So, and that was the first time we've ever really done an event where people got to see quartz watchmaking hands-on. And I think it was eye opening yeah. for a lot of people. So you got to see a full block of the quartz crystal yeah. and all sorts of other cool little things. And then at the top, it was like a it was like a boutique where we had almost every model you could possibly imagine, and uh, you know a bunch of other stuff, and you know of course some some drinks and some stuff drinks like that. That's true. Yeah. yeah. And then in the uh, the group of collectors, I mean, had the watches that were there. Uh, some of like the rarest. Oh yeah. Watches. There was I don't even remember I don't know the reference number, but it was one of the manual wound spring drives that they made on like twenty of that was in Japan a release. I don't know. Yeah. It yeah. was just and like that a guy was handed SPG-Y to me. Y005. Yeah. yeah, I think that's yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. I was looking at it, I, was, I didn't register me at first that it was that. I was like, Oh, it's that. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. You notice it and it has kind of a similar dial to your uh, yeah. Shunbun, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, no, it was uh, it was very cool. And, and yeah, fantastic event. I'm I'm very much looking forward to whatever the next event is. So, so. you know, we will continue on with mm-hmm. GS9 Club events, and we only hope to make them bigger and better. Awesome, mm-hmm. awesome. So, and, and to become a member, you just, so you, for, you just have so to purchase a grand stake. Yeah, for the U.S. market, you <laughs> yeah. know, we, we actually, uh, you know, where Japan had, yeah. the, when they started the club, uh, was the start date. We actually uh, backdated it to when Grand Seiko became an independent brand, which was, uh, you know, in March of 2017. So basically, okay. if you purchased a watch from March 2017 forward, mm-hmm. uh, you're eligible to enter the club. It had to have been from a U.S.-based authorized retailer, okay. and, and you know you have to have proof. But you know, fair enough. Fair yep, enough. Yep. So with the that GS9 club event, you, you did mention it was at Jazz at Lincoln Center, and then that's another interesting development is that you're a sponsor of Jazz at Lincoln Center. Yeah, that's we're the second. official timekeeper. The official timekeeper of Jazz. Yeah, of Jazz. How, <laughs> One mean, of the hardest cool things. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. It's uh, yeah. 
you know it's it's really been a great setup for us we've done yeah. a lot of different collaborations there and uh I, you know i'm lucky because i got to see a lot of great performances uh yeah. you know at, cool. at the venue so and they have the dizzy's uh dizzy's uh, jazz club there which mm. is awesome so that's uh you know it's it's been a treat for everyone on the grand seiko team and i think vice versa you know mm -hmm. it's a it's just been a great uh, partnership overall so yeah. yeah that's that's awesome yeah i think Got to go to a holiday concert. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks again. That was fun. Oh yeah. No. That's um, a talked to the drummer after. Yeah. For a while, which I didn't. The, the perfect person to talk to, given the timekeeping element, which I, the yeah. pun didn't occur <laughs> to me when I was talking to him, but, uh, <laughs> but still very cool. Um, so yeah, I, we we have a bunch of questions from uh, from our our Instagram audience, but I, I still also have a few more. But um, yeah, no, I'm just what I'm here for. I know? think. I think so. Back to the White Birch. So the White Birch came out, and then it had kind of a great year. It uh, won the GPHG award. Today. Yes, that was. Uh, you know, I was so excited for that because I, yeah. I really felt it was a great contender. And I mean, there were, of course, you know, in men's category, right? It's a mm. very broad spectrum of of amazing watches in that category, and you know, some really great brands. Two really heavy hitters, I thought, uh, were great contenders, of course. Um, you know who both won you know uh, other other prizes so mm -hmm. that's okay one of which uh, they won two but anyways white birch uh you know I, I was very very excited to see that you know mm -hmm. i have a lot of admiration for the watch i told you i've been you know you know hunting it <laughs> yeah to say the least i mean it's just yeah. like I, I was desperate for it yeah right? Right. and um so you know when it won uh it, it was a huge honor for us that's actually our second award at the grand prix Oh, awesome. So mm -hmm. we won the Prix de la Petite Gouille, uh in 2014 for the High Beat GMT oh, okay. with the Mounty Watte dial. Oh, very cool. So I'm not yeah. going to attempt to pronounce the name of that award. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm not very good at it either. So for my French-speaking friends, I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that's, um, that's, that's incredibly cool. So do you think... Um, has this watch sort of become like a flagship of the brand, or is it like currently at least... I think that, that uh, yes, um, I think that the you know the Grand Prix brought some some great recognition uh, mm -hmm. where it's due, of course. Um, but on top of that, I think it was already a flagship before we yeah. won that award. It was very highly sought after. the The movement is amazing. We've already had you know uh, we've already you know tore into the movement pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, the dial is spectacular, and it's a very complex dial to make. Yeah. Um, you know, and it's very close to the crystal which I think just creates a totally new element. You know, it's um, where, you know, the Snowflake, which I've worn for many years and I, I will love and it will always be one of my favorite Grand Seikos. Um, you know, the dial texture is a little more subtle. Mm -hmm. It's uh, further down, you know, in the case. So it's you know, more recessed in there and further away from your eyes, let's say. Um, you know, this is a, a little more visually impressive mm -hmm. and you know i don't want to say aggressive but you know it it really captures the the design scheme that we were going for with the white birch you yeah. know, kind of forest yeah so i felt when i had it for a little while and reviewed it that like it definitely felt like the various like elements that people associate with uh you know grand seiko from dial textures to the finishing was all just kind of turned up a yeah. little bit but yeah like the literal depth of like the the peaks and valleys that are yeah. create that white birch texture are just they're just it's like th it's it's more dramatic it's quite literally to like turned up um i mean you can see it from the watches we have here like this the shimbun is kind of it's very delicate and kind of surface yeah kirizuri is that how you pronounce that or yeah I kirizuri get, is correct, oh, look at that, i got that right um <laughs> that one's probably the least that's probably the most subtle of the group and then this one's just like boom yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> no, and this is, face. this. you know, yeah. all of our dials that have these amazing textures, you know, probably one of the number one questions, maybe one of the questions mm -hmm. you have for me today, we'll um, <laughs> you know, is like, how, how do we make these dials? And it's yeah. mostly done by press, so applying okay. a couple hundred tons of pressure to a metal dial base, yeah. uh, you know, for the white birch, as an example, we have to do that seven times Okay. Wow. Um, to create this, you know, very dramatic texture. And what's crazy is, you know, we have these insane tolerances. Like when you look at the snowflake, which I said is very subtle, mm -hmm. you know, the difference in height, these peaks and valleys on the snowflake, which, you know, this is the challenge, right? Is like, it's it's like 0 0.04 millimeter difference from the highest point to oh, the wow. lowest point. So it's, it's almost non-existent. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I think that's very interesting, you know, so. Yeah. The other thing too is a lot of these dials, you know, granted we're applying pressure to the metal dial base, 
um, but we need to have some kind of dye or mold mm. uh, to create the texture. So a lot of them, like your shunbun as an example, uh, you know, is, is a hand-carved mold. Mm. Not a lot of people know that. So an yeah. artist goes in and has to carve the mold and uh, to create this, you know, very delicate cool. pattern. So do they? Do you know how they carve it? Is it like carved in wax and then like molded out into metal? Or no, I think that's actually carved onto the metal. Oh wow! Yeah, that's, that's even cool. Um, and then is it like so they they apply it seven times? Is there different like grades of it or is it the same yeah. you know like does it go from kind of rough to more fine or is it the same one that just it just it's not always the same it's the not. same mold right it's not yeah. okay yeah. That's not for i mean at least in this instance from what i've seen so and then the color of the dial is a silver application is that correct? yeah so i mean you get you get silver and white in terms of the overall appearance mm -hmm. and uh you know there's um now we have a, also a spring drive white birch that yeah, we awesome. uh, will be launching starting February 1st. Yeah. Um, it's already been announced, so it's yeah. not, not a top secret, but uh, you know, we have uh, you know, 9R A2 mm -hmm. in, in that particular one, and the dial is totally different. Yeah. So it's, not, it's more white, I would say, as opposed to silver, um, but you know, there's silver plating techniques that we have that can achieve a pure white too. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting. That, yeah, that's pretty neat. So. We actually had a question from Dr. Ravi72. Let's assume that's how his name is pronounced. Is <laughs> asking about specifically. So is the dial finishing the same on both the high beat and spring drive versions of the white birch, which they are different dials? Yeah, you know? yeah, completely. Um, you know, and that's kind of the neat yeah. thing about our brand is you have two watches right in front of you. You know, the Shunbun and then the Kirazuri, the uh, Genbi Valley version. Um, these are made in two totally different studios. They are two totally different made dials, cases, movements. Mm -hmm. Everything is basically separate. So, yeah. you know, it's like, uh, it's. I don't want to say it's like buying two brands, but, you know, if you buy a spring drive, you ultimately feel like you need a mechanical because you <laughs> want something from Shinshu and Shizuku. Right. If you can pronounce His, those names, that's the other challenge for yeah, most of them, right? If you can, I, I'll have to have those written down in front of me before I even try. Um, but that, that's actually really interesting. So it's two studios interpreting one concept. And so would you say then like with, with the, uh, the new spring drive version, does that speak to like the aesthetics more, the poetic sort of style of that studio versus, uh, versus the other? Or, I mean, one thing I find kind of interesting is that since the spring drive is a gentle glide around and that yeah. dial is much more gentle and soft. Yeah, it coincides like, a lot better. You right? know? Yeah. So it's interesting that it's, you know, two concepts. I don't know. Does this just say, yeah, I guess does it speak to those? I, I yeah. think that yeah. that is intentional. Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, but I can't say for certain. So, right. you know, I... I uh, I haven't had that discussion, <laughs> yeah. you know, and unfortunately, you know, travel to Japan's uh, not really happening right now, but, uh, you know, hopefully not in the too distant future. Yeah. But, um, you know, so the communications that we have, you know, are not uh, as uh, widely, you know, spread as if we were able to have a sit down conversation. Right, right. But, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, it, you know, it, it makes total sense, mm -hmm. right? Um, I think that, you know, I think that you hit the nail on the head with, you know, that, that kind of smooth flowing expression of spring drive is, mm -hmm. is more appropriate on the on the variation of the white birch that's done by our Shinshu studio where yeah. the spring drive's made. So. Yeah. If I were to be poetic myself, I'd imagine it was like, it's like a softer wind versus like a, yeah. a jerky. Like, yeah. <laughs> Don't quote me or ever listen to that again. Um, <laughs> you're good, but, uh, you're good. Don't worry. Um, I've noticed like there's there's quite a difference in the aesthetic, particularly between the 9S A5 movement yeah. and the 9R A2 movement. Apologies for having to look down to get those numbers Not, right every single don't worry. time. It's okay. um, does that also speak to like the difference in the in the studios or like yeah, what yeah. drives that? Yeah. So yeah, the uh, the finishing on the white birch with the 9S A5 caliber, you know, we have the Shizukuishi River finish, uh, which is striping. So, okay. you know, this is uh, a new technique that we've just applied. You know, previous 9S calibers, we do uh, line gradation stripes, which are very deeply grooved and, and perfectly polished. So they reflect light, gives mm -hmm. kind of a rainbow effect. Um, with, uh, with this new pattern, it's much softer mm -hmm. um, and, you know, a little bit more of a matte finish. And the reason we chose that is, you know, the, the beveling around the bridges on 9S A5, mm. it, you know, is dominant. So we okay. want to highlight that, which is, you know, catching these glimmers of light, very highly polished, and we want to have great contrast of light and shadow, 
right? Mm-hmm. It's a part of our, our design cue and our brand, a Japanese aesthetic that, uh, you know, is, is very important for, you know, kind of defining, uh, you know, certain characteristics about the, about the watch. Uh, with the 9RA2 or 9RA5, they look the same. You know, one has a power reserve on the back, one has it on the front. Mm-hmm. Um, they chose to do a frosted finish, which Shinshu in central Japan, um, Nagano Prefecture is very renowned for their winters. Actually, both areas are renowned for their winters. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, the mountain range in central Japan uh, is great skiing, snowboarding. You know, they had the 98 Winter Olympics there. Uh, for an example, and so like the hoarfrost that they get in central Japan is the expression of the finishing technique as opposed to striping, mm-hmm. and uh, you know it's it's really beautifully done. Um, but the one thing that is a little different on the 9R A2 and 5 is that the edges of the bridges and even on the rotor um, is convex beveling, so it's all rounded. Mm-hmm. And we're not, you know, we do that out of our micro artist studio mm-hmm. where, you know, they have to do it with hand files and, and uh, you know, sticks of wood with the diamond paste. Oh. But, you know, to do that, obviously, you're talking of 50, 40K starting, you know, right. price range. Uh, where 9R A2, you know, we're looking at 9100. Yeah. So, you know, the price is significantly different. Uh, it's not done in those old school techniques. It's, mm-hmm. it's done through a new proprietary process. That's so, very cool. Yeah. So no other brand has convex bevels Done executed in, by machine in that way. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that's, yeah. That's so it's cool. a new diamond cutting technique, basically. Oh, yeah. yeah. So very uh, you know interesting that we're we're making strides in new finishing techniques that mm-hmm. you know that will give a new aesthetic to Grand Seiko. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, no, that's very cool. And I forget the name of the caliber in the, in the three the seventy two hour hand wound mm-hmm. uh, movement. The nine is sixty four. The uh, the spring drive. Oh, the spring drive nine R thirty one is the like you know under ten k. Okay. You know, yeah. and then we have nine R two, which is the three. It's a three and a half day power. Yeah. I I, lo- I love colors. the look of of that movement. The kind of like larger plate, the the softer finish on it. I mean, it's just it's just a very nice contrast. I mean, it's, it's like wildly different than yeah this movement here, which has that. Oh, there's title of striping that you're talking about. Which you have the deeper uh, line gradation stripes on the 9S64 yeah. mechanical movement. 9R31 is a single piece bridge because it's such a thin movement. Mm. We wanted to enhance its durability. Okay. So a uh, single piece bridge helps keep it more stable and more shock resistant. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we apply the hairline finishing. That's actually done by hand too. Which is oh, wow. Neat. Yeah. Oh, that's very cool. Yeah. yeah. It looks simpler, but it's actually... More it's a, yeah, it's yeah. more expensive to make in general for a few different reasons. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> um, kind of, uh, just kind of going back to sort of the differences and things. Um, we, we have a question from um, Brenny underscore JS at Brenny JS. Um, is do you ex- plan on expanding the nine F quartz line to include more of the wonderful dials GS does? And I'm just kind of curious, like it's nine F. You know, how does that play into the kind of the studios and how those things are uh, determined? Yeah, so, you know, I mean, obviously I can't speak on future product. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, you know, that, that's a big no Sorry, all these questions. Yeah, <laughs> sorry, uh, all the questions, um, you know, but it, I can honestly tell you that, you yeah. know, we've already kind of started on that path. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the prime example I can think of off the top of my head is last year we introduced two tough quartz models with ceramic bezels, mm-hmm. uh, SBGN 019 and 021. Uh, which have this pressed sunray pattern mm. that is really, really good. I mean, it's it's very similar to like the Godzilla watch we did in 2019 or the SBG Y003, which was the first 9R31 okay. uh, that we did. It's kind of okay. a similar uh, texture, but, um, you know, I mean, that's that's a prime example of, you know, an amazing quartz watch with a great dial texture. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I would say that, you know, in terms of what we plan to do in the future, obviously I can't I can't say anything in that regard. But I don't think that uh, you know we'll forget about quartz. Yeah. Uh, you know, like uh, it's just it's it's not our style. You know, we're proud of our quartz, and we should be. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. You know, it's a very practical movement, and that's what Grand Seiko is all about: is practical watchmaking. Yeah. Yeah. Makes so. makes sense. I, I kind of like also, frankly, that there is a little bit more of a of a flavor difference in the yeah. court in the quartz watches. I mean, like the the, the kind of truncated case that's on that one. I mean, I guess you could call it sort of a barrel shape, but I know it kind of, it still relates obviously to the history yeah. of, uh, of, um, of Grand Seiko and uh, I'm totally blanking on the 
the philosophy, the uh, the, uh, the grammar like, of design, the grammar of design, the philosophy, yeah, yeah, the, the philosophy, the Grand Seiko yeah. style, the, yeah, yeah, yeah whatever you want to call it. Is. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know it's still very much in that style. And then you know, there's the sportier ones with the bezel, the uh, like fixed bezels, but they all kind of feel like a, it's, a, it's a it's a different collection. I don't know, in, yeah. in, a, in, a, in a good way. I mean, you know, there's. Um, I think that's what you're seeing now yeah. is like some some unity coming to mm -hmm. to the lineup in terms of the sport design and elegance design. Uh, Heritage has always kind of had its place. Yeah. Um, you know, and and that's I mean because prior to 2017, Grand Seiko as a was a collection under the Seiko umbrella, yeah. and Heritage was the brand. Right. You know, it's like so now you know we're starting to really diversify, and that was what. Be being independent was all about mm -hmm. and uh you know you're starting to see that you know formation of uh you know really defined sports collection and mm -hmm. dress collection as well with elegance yeah so yeah. yeah the um that automatic gmt you guys came out with last year and I'm, I'm gonna forget the the numbers on that that was a little bit simpler but it, it was with the uh, the hairline finish bezel like the, yes, the brush bezel, yes, yes. the 24-hour scale yeah. bezel. Yeah, SPGM 245 and 47. Yeah. And I like that that one was, you know, whereas these are going more in the poetic nature direction, that was kind of like a straight-up, like, sport watch. Yep. You know? In a no, very, it was very well received. You know, There's yeah. no denying that. Yeah, no, it was, it was very cool. I almost forgot about that one. I was great, putting together questions. Great colors, like, too. Like yeah, that olive the, green and that, you know, midnight blue, very similar. You know, not, not like the same, yeah. but... Uh, Similar in you know mm -hmm. to the dial of the 44 GS spring drive you got on so um, yeah for sure you can just like talk about models all day and I, I can I have some questions and I, will. I gotta so stop me when yeah. I need to <laughs> so this is an interesting <laughs> question and it might be it's kind of funny so at N8 Cardenas asked what grid what grit sandpaper would Zeratsu polish be if it were on the same scale. <laughs> So, you know, I've, uh, I, I'm honestly like, I'm going to say, you know, I, I have a couple of ideas, but not all Zeratsu is the same, mm. right? So that's, that's one thing. Uh, some of the, some of the materials and stuff like that, that we're using, um, you know, are not disclosed. Yeah. Um, so, you know, in, in reality, you know, and it's not always necessarily a paper that we're using either. Mm. Like the, you know, the, the wheel itself is either tin or aluminum, um, but you know, there's use, generally it's an abrasive sheet of, mm -hmm. of paper on the front, like a sandpaper, and, uh, but not all Zeratsu is created equal, so it's, okay. not, always, it's not always the, the same sheet, or it's not always a sheet in itself. So I can't really answer that <laughs> question clearly Cryptic or answer. with, uh, yeah. you know, uh, for fear of, uh, <laughs> you know, disclosing too much. Of course. Um, <laughs> but uh, very good question. Yeah. So, so I, I thought that was interesting to even think about it because, like, when you get to the final product, it is this, like, completely perfect, you know, black mirror kind of finish, yeah. which, like, is it seems almost beyond the level of grit. Like, it was polished. You know, it's, of course, that is, like, as... As hyper fine as you get, you yeah, get to the level. Yeah. But yeah, it's. A, I mean, there's different things that, you know. for different materials too. Yeah. So when you're talking about a steel case versus a titanium case, you know, everything, yeah. everything's a little different. Everything's so a little different. Yeah. Shape of the so, case. Yeah. Sorry, but you're probably not going to set up as a rusty polishing studio that easy. Yeah, yeah, even if you <laughs> even if you did, I mean, it's. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You have to learn for 30 and, more years. Yeah. Good luck. Good luck. Um, it's something that I, then I kind of want to ask you about. So with the, the Gemby Valley watches, the yeah. trio of uh, hand-wound watches in the 37.3 millimeter case, which I was lucky enough to get the 277 version, SBGW 277. Um, this was just interesting. So A, it was outside of the seasons, it was, but it was still in nature. Yeah, um, absolutely. I, and can you talk a little bit about the, the, the inspiration for these colors? Because you had like three of the most subtle, little distinct colors. Yeah. Distinct greens, but they're... Everyone went crazy trying to pick between the three, and then if it was you very waited challenging, too long, right? you waited too long. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was very challenging. Yeah. So, you know, I know a lot of people, uh, you know, they really liked the entire assortment, and yeah. if you were to offer them any one of the three, they would have been fine, right? But we had a light, uh, a light green that would, uh, a lot of people have called pistachio. Mm. Um, we had more of a like a tealish green, yeah. uh, you know, and then we had the more true green. Uh, you know that 
made up the collection, and these hues were specifically picked from imagery of the Gembi Valley itself in Iwate Prefecture in northern Japan. So there's this, uh, you know, beautiful river running through it, and the teal is kind of like a, the hue of the river, and, mm. you know, the trees and the bushes are the other two greens. Mm. So it's, uh, you know, it, I, you know, to be perfectly honest with you, if I had to choose one, I couldn't decide. Yeah. I, you know, I, I thought that the teal one was my favorite, then I went through a phase where I thought this one was my favorite, and I think that like before they sold out, I was you know looking at the one with the light green dial, and I love the blue second hand. You know, yeah, it's hard not to love the blue second hand. That definitely gave it a little extra, like oh, but yeah. this one's got the blue second hand. <laughs> so you know, it's tough, and yeah. uh, you know, I, I'm I'm glad that um, I kept my eyes focused in one direction, and that was towards the birch. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's so, uh, you know, that way, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I, I wasn't taking my eyes anywhere else till I had that one, so. It was also very cool just to see attention brought back to this model, because I feel like, yeah. um, actually, when I went into the Nature of Time uh, exhibit, uh, the, the pop-up, I remember seeing the, I guess it's the two, I forget the, the number, but the, the white dial that's just, yeah, the SPGW 231 is the international model, and then they also had the one on a bracelet, the 235. The 235, yeah. yeah. So I saw I saw the 231 in the case, and I was like looking at everything else, and I just I was unaware of that model, and I was just like, is that a vintage Grand Seiko sitting in the middle of the case <laughs> that like nobody told me about? Kind of. Um, yeah. And yeah, I mean, I tried it on then, you know, with that one, and I it was immediately like I feel like I could I could have walked out that day with it. It wasn't. It wasn't in the cards, but like I could have, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, no. And now you and well, have a, a, a more rare version, uh, yeah. more colorful I mean, I'm, version. I'm, I'm glad I waited in the end, <laughs> but um, I don't know if there's uh, it, what's the the story behind this model? Is it what is it based on? Just in general, so, yeah, the, the, the hand wound SPG. The the SPGW two thirty one and basically that entire case line yeah. and it, this case design also exists in uh, like SPGM two two one. Okay. Uh, in our elegance collection, our you know ivory dial GMT with mm. the kind of burgundy brown strap, um, with the blue GMT hand that everyone loves, like that's one of right, our right. top sellers. So that case design is essentially the same between the two models, just a little mm. smaller on this because of the uh, manual wine caliber. Mm -hmm. um, but it literally takes DNA from the first Grand Seiko from 1960. So it's not an exact recreation. We do right. have that in our lineup now. Uh, that's a true recreation. But it's influenced by that first Grand Seiko from 1960, more rounded than any other Grand Seiko that's in the lineup today. Mm. Um, the lugs, though, you know, straight lugs, but very beveled, mm -hmm. uh, and have this uh, lovely little triangular um, point, which you know, small design cue, but yeah. very well executed, and uh, you know, also increases the difficulty in the Zaratsu of polishing, of course. Right. So. You know, the uh, the other thing that I love about it, and it doesn't fit with Grand Seiko's, you know, like, grammar of design for the 44GS, and mm -hmm. it doesn't have to because this was the first Grand Seiko, right? Yeah, yeah. At least based on it, is the dial's actually domed. Okay. And the hands are Very curved so. to follow the uh, curvature of the dial. And you don't see that on many Grand Seikos because when they introduced the 44GS in 1967, the design code then became always have a flat dial. Mm. And, you know, obviously we don't always play by those those rules because it was set, you know, for one watch, let's mm -hmm. say. But uh, it did kind of set the standard for every Grand Seiko moving forward. So that's a rare feature in itself. Yeah. And, uh, you know, then on top of that, you have the box-shaped sapphire crystal, which makes it look super vintage. Yeah. But it's sapphire, yeah. so you don't have to worry about, you know. Yeah, no worries at all. That, that uh, <laughs> instant damage that, you know, uh, pretty much every one of my pieces has a scratch on the, on the <laughs> acrylic because of... I'm clumsy. It's, I'm it's I'm right there with you. Yeah, I haven't. I, yeah. This one's still the precious one, though. I am wearing it probably too much to keep it precious. But um, you know, I think th there was a lot of questions and about uh, that we got about you know forty. Like everyone wants a watch that's under forty millimeters, or mm -hmm. when is this watch going to be under forty millimeters? Blah blah. blah. Um, they have a watch that's under forty. <laughs> this is a thirty-seven point three millimeter watch. Sure, it's not the same case as all these other things, but. This watch, I think, if, if people are looking for a smaller Grand Seiko, like I would send them just to this to this case because it is it wears so well. Yeah. And if you're if 37.3 sounds too small for you, I would I think you should still try it because it's a 19 millimeter lug, so it's actually got like a broader shoulder on it, and yep. it it fits. I don't know, it just wears it wears better than I expected it to. Like yeah. it doesn't feel small, it doesn't feel big. It's just kind of perfect. I don't know. 
very well proportioned. Yeah, and has thirty-seven point three, which is nice. <laughs> that point yeah. three makes a difference. Yeah, it's a lot of dial <laughs> space too. Yeah. So even you know, like if you prefer a thirty-nine, let's say, yeah. you know, you can you would probably still accept this because yeah. it's so much dial space. And then you you also came out with the uh, duo of thirty-four millimeter nine F quartz watches. I just correct. The, uh, I haven't seen those in person yet. Yeah, they're, I mean they're great. It's uh, you know it's it, it, it's more possible to make small sizes like that mm. using our nine F quartz because it's a smaller caliber. Yeah. And uh, you know, funny fact, like nine F uh, generally has anywhere from like starting around one hundred and thirty components, which you know, oh, well. is, uh, that's a lot for quartz, and compares to a lot more mechanical watches than it would uh, quartz, but. You know, it's still very compact and very thin. So that was a perfect fit to create kind of a mid-size, right? Mm -hmm. At that at that uh, at that size, and nine um, S sixty four are manual wine calibers, also great. We can you know create mm -hmm. it pretty compact. But when you start moving into some of our other calibers, you know the caliber is pretty wide, mm -hmm. and uh, you know they, they come with limitations in terms of creating a watch that's ultimately durable and easy to read, and mm -hmm. you know has all the practical elements that are necessary for Grand Seiko. Yeah, so that makes sense. Um, I also think you know, thirty-four millimeters sounds really small by like today's standards, but there's so many thirties. Like thirty-six has become much more common, and every time yeah. I put a thirty-six millimeter watch, I'm like, I could go smaller. <laughs> yeah. so, I don't know. I, I just I, I'm excited to to try that one on. It, there are some questions that are interesting about like, particularly the dive watches being less than forty. But I actually remember at the GS9 Club event, you specifically talking about how like, there's a real philosophy of making the dive watches really tough. Yeah, like, yeah, it's, th it's super important. I mean, yeah. that's what, you know, kind of a dive watch is known for, is being yeah. tough, durable. And, you know, another important criteria for Grand Seiko is, like, you know, having them easy to service. Mm. You know, because with a dive watch, you're treating it poorly. You're taking it in maybe the water, in the sand. It's probably got mud or dirt or something in there. And, you know, that builds up in the crown and in the bezel. Yeah. And so, like, those two elements need to be really easy to clean and service because, you know, that's the most frequent issue area in any watch mm. right if, especially if it's a dive watch because you know you treat it a little more rough than you would you know a non-dive watch even though yeah, yeah. many people who own dive watches don't ever go diving with them you know they just use them as a tool yeah. yeah i've never, I've never <laughs> taken a diving but you know it's uh you know to each their own i guess mm -hmm. in that in that regard whether you dive with it or not but, you know, in order to make this, like, highly durable, you know, you need to have a crown protector, you need to have an easy stem and crown system to, to clean out, and also uh, the bezel, you know, is, is another important factor, too. Mm -hmm. So designing the bezel so it's easy to clean out service and, you know, get it turning again, because, you know, if you yeah. got too much sand or grit in there, it ain't going to turn. Yeah. <laughs> so, Joe, I don't know, uh, I don't know, I don't know how much you can answer this question, but... Sure, I'll what, try. What, what's, what's, what can we look forward to from Grand Seiko in the coming year or years, uh, oh, you know? Man, that, <laughs> that's a tough one. You know, yeah. I, I did mention... Without unveiling it, anything, what yeah, can you tell I can't, us Yeah, I can't unveil know? anything, but, um, you know, I, I, one of the things that I personally admire about Grand Seiko is constant innovation. Mm -hmm. You know, they never slow down. It's always something new, whether it's a new movement type, which I'm, you know, but that's, you know, always exciting me. Yeah. Um, you know, a new method of Zeratsu, a new case design that's exceeding anything we've ever done before. Uh, you know, looking at the white birch, the hands, the design of the markers, this is a new design that this is way more easy to read than my snowflake. And I couldn't believe that because I love mm. how legible my snowflake is. And I find this way easier to read in dark settings. So, you know, there's constant evolution, you know, hence the Evolution 9 collection with, uh, yeah. with this new series. It, it's really um, always exciting. Yeah. And so don't ever think that, you know, Grand Seiko is going to slow down, whether it's movement or, you know, I mean, you can look back, uh, you know, in 2020, we, we had a concept movement. You know, for the first time, uh, the T0. -Zero. You know, I mean, like, yeah, how cool yeah. would that be if, if something came to light of that? So, you know, I mean, there's just so many cool things. Uh, and, you know, a lot of these projects that they work on, you know, you look at the 9SA5, which was under development for about nine years. And, you know, I mean, Spring Drive as a whole, which 22 years to first commercial production watch and 28 years before it was a continuous production product. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, there's always something cooking. Yeah. And uh, don't ever think for a second <laughs> we're going to slow down. 
That ain't, well, that you, ain't the case. <laughs> I mean, you know, we're at the end of January, and I think there's been at least four releases, five maybe. Correct. Yeah. Since the year started, so. Yeah. No. It's yeah. Uh, and um, you know, it, in all honesty, like you know, we've kind of changed the way we release watches, and in, mm-hmm. in the last couple of years, based on the fact we haven't been in a trade show, right. and uh, you know, we haven't been in Basel since 2019, and you know, I. I I think that the new releases on nearly a monthly basis, almost mm-hmm. every month we have uh, some new release, has been great for the brand in a lot of different ways. But uh, you know, this year we're going to be back at Watches and Wonders in end of March and, mm-hmm. and through April, and um, you know we're really looking forward to going to Geneva and you know right. showcasing what we have new. Right. And uh, you so there know. might be a big moment at the end of March, early April. I mean, I, you don't have to guarantee it, but yeah, I guess, you know, like, listen, watch industry wide. There'll be a lot of things coming up. I will say that I'm excited. Mix. You're okay. I'm very excited. Joe is excited. So yeah, yeah. I mean, excited, it doesn't I'm take excited, much, yeah. I guess, for me. But <laughs> you know what? It's yeah. uh, you know, it's a very exciting time for the brand. So yeah, very cool. I think that uh, I think that everyone has a lot to be proud of. And come the you know. First, first week of April. <laughs> all, right, all right. Well, I'm very excited for it. I uh, I hope I can do better at resisting this year. I have to <laughs> give some other brands attention. It's only fair to them that I spend know. some you know t- time and all of my watch budget. We don't we don't we don't mind you buying up all the game takers. Yeah, no. It's okay, Zach. Don't um, worry. <laughs> but it is always exciting. I mean, they're you know, it's a it suits my aesthetic. And I think, you know, you yeah. find a brand that kind of fi- suits your tastes and, you know, Seiko and Grand Seiko just, uh, I ha- happen to be in that, that aesthetic zone there, just the, the, the style, the, the texture, the color, yeah. just, just all of it. So it's, uh, it's rough for me. It's really rough. Um, <laughs> well, know. thank you. I, th- yeah. I certainly, uh, you know, take that as a compliment. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, Joe, thank you uh, so much. Totally my back. pleasure. Thank yeah. you for having me. So, of course. Of course. Yeah. And, uh, that was time number three and we look forward to uh, a fourth. Uh, yeah, of course. Right. Anytime. Awesome. All right, Thank cool. you. Thanks, Zach.